All right, hi, I'm Brian Cordell, and uh, welcome to this recurring series of chats that we've been doing for a few years now at various Blinkons. Uh, we hope that it's not just fun and interesting, but hopefully we're helping to sort of build a shared people's history of the web that people can watch for long into the future to learn about the folks that helped build and shape the web. So I'm here today with Nicole Sullivan. Hi, thanks for having me. And Nicole, you're uh, at Google now. Yeah, I'm a product manager um, for UI capabilities at Google, which includes um, all different things like rendering and uh, layout and style and animations and um, scrolling and input and a ton of different areas. It actually also includes UI dev tools, which is like all the stuff for like editing and debugging your HTML and CSS. Yeah. So, okay. So let's talk about history. Uh, like I always ask about backgrounds because like, um, it's hard to imagine today where we all walk around with like the whole internet in our pocket or on our wrist all the time. Right. But before the web was so pervasive, um, which was not really that long ago, um, it wasn't really straightforward, like how somebody would come to learn about the web or like get involved with it or why you would even want to. So I, I like hearing like everybody's interesting stories about that. So can you like tell me your story? Like where you come from? Like how did we get here? Well, I came from a little island off the coast of Maine. We didn't get cable TV even until I think I was a teenager. Um, they didn't get internet, even like any access to internet until after I left for college. Um, I don't think I was aware that the internet existed or even even email until I went to a, a party at college and uh, I met this wonderful nerdy man and or I guess more of a boy, but um, he gave me his email address and I was like, oh, shoot, I better learn how to use email. <laughs> so wait, like for context, though, what year was that? Probably ish. That would have been like 96, 95. Yeah, so that was pretty early. It was pretty early, yeah. Yeah, yeah you yeah. still went to a computer lab to, um, you know, use a computer that was there. Yeah, I mean, I, I hate, I feel like I've said this on every single one of these, but just like for context, I learned about the web in a bookstore, like a, a physical bookstore, which like you, they're hard to even find anymore, but... Yeah. Oh, they're having a comeback though. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so you uh, grew up in this small town. You got an email uh, address. and um, But that's still a long way toward uh, where I know you from, which is actually um, speaking and stuff. Like I uh, learned about yeah. you in my own career. I uh, saw you speak online. Um, well, recorded online anyway. So how do we get from there to... To there and yeah. to where you are now. So by way of being a carpenter? Um, yeah, I, exactly. It's a totally straightforward <laughs> way. Yeah. Um, I finished school. I got a degree in economics and um, I didn't know what to do with myself. And my dad and my grandfather had been carpenters and it's something I had always wanted to do, but my family was very education oriented. You're going to go to school. You're going to get a good job. I, even if they weren't really quite sure what that good job was, they wanted me to go to school so I could go and, and get it. Um, and so now, free of their expectations, having completed school, I went and joined a carpentry crew and started building houses frame to finish. And I know this is something that you and I share in common as a, a background as a laborer before jumping into tech. Yeah. And also my, my dad, my grandfather, my other grandfather, I always joke this, like my cousin Vinny, do you know, remember that? Like, this is how I know about it because like, every, like literally every relative I have was, that's what they did. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I also um, swung a hammer. Yeah. Yeah. I did for about three years. I built a bunch of houses. I built kitchens. I built uh, roofs and all kinds of other stuff. And um, I was so strong. I could lift like 240 pounds back then wow. and I only weighed like 110. So wow. um, yeah, uh, but I hurt myself, unsurprisingly, lifting that kind of weight as a tiny person. 
And my doctors basically said, you've got to stop being a carpenter. Or you're going to really struggle when you're older. Your, your body's going to be unwell. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of my family did actually struggle like later in life a lot with that. So I'm glad yeah. that we were able to move on. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I, at the time I took it as they're pointing out something about me, about my body, mm -hmm. but then looking at the folks that I worked with then, and, and, you know, I'm still in touch with a bunch of them now, they all have body pain and, yeah. you know, injuries that don't heal and things like that. So I feel like, uh, you know, I was lucky to find a different path that didn't, that Absolutely. didn't lead to that. So, uh, so you get injured and, um, you know about email. Um, so <laughs> I knew a little get, more at that point. How did we get to the web? Just emailed yeah, so Tim Berners Lee and said, Hey, I heard about this web thing. How do I get involved? <laughs> Kind of. Um, I had moved into this while I was a carpenter, I had moved into this like communal house in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where it just so happened that the group that hung out there was one half artists and makers and builders and folks like that. And the other half was um, nerds and tech people. Um, in fact, a bunch of people who worked at the W3C hung out there, including Philippe Le Egaré and, and a few other people that would sort of come to be lifelong friends. And I was hearing from them about specifications and all this sort of stuff. And, you know, didn't really know what it, what it meant. But when I had to stop being a carpenter, I was like, what do I do with myself? Oh, well, I've been hearing about this nerd stuff. Why don't I check it out? And so I read the XML schema specification and my brain was just like melting. <laughs> I don't think I was like, I don't want to do this, whatever this is. Right. Um, and so then I read the CSS specification and I thought, oh, this is great. This is really interesting. I could do this. Um, I didn't understand that it meant um, that I thought a spec meant that's how things worked, not mm -hmm. it's how things will work. So when I got started trying things in browsers around like 2001, 2002, I was like, this just doesn't work how they said it would. Something's yeah. wrong here. <laughs> I think everybody had sort of that experience. I don't know, like my... I've written before about my own experience with standards being that, um, you know, I sort of, I, I just heard they were a, like a standards organization and mm. that just sounds like a magical thing, right? Like it just, <laughs> just, right. I mean, it just sounds like it's important, big, important. It's like government or something, you know, mm. and you know, they're the ones that sort of like write the, the law, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and you think, you know, that's like the best and brightest and, you know, they all get together and then they just like hand down the tablets from on high and, that, and then that's how it is. And um, yeah, it's not really like that at all. <laughs> yeah. And for me, it was just this place that a bunch of my friends worked and, um, you know, so I... I went to long before I was in tech, when I was still a carpenter, I went to a W3C event in the south of France. And um, I met Tim Berners-Lee there. And I was just like, oh, cool nerd, no big deal. <laughs> um, and I met, um, actually, I was more impressed with, I don't remember his last name. I think his first name was Alan, and he invented the joystick. And I was just like, whoa, you're super, super cool. Awesome. Yeah. So for me, all these people were just sort of extensions of my friend group, which was really lucky because it made tech, which otherwise could have been really out of reach, seem seem accessible. Cool. So you wound up in France, right? Yeah. And you wound up working for a French agency? Oh, there were some steps between... Oh, tell me, please tell me. I moved to France and um, I started doing like some accessibility work, taking taking um, huge like 100 page Word docs and converting them to accessible HTML because software needed to have accessible documentation if they wanted to sell it to education and, and to uh, government and things like that. Um, and then I was like, hey, I think I think I kind of like this tech stuff. I think I'll take a, a night class in Java and um, see if I like it. Um, 
so I signed up for something. And when I got there, it was like a, an enormous hall with like maybe, I don't know, 300 or 500 students in it. And I was like, this is strange. But I didn't speak French yet. So I'm just sort of desperately trying to understand literally anything that's happening. And about three months in, I realized I've actually signed up for a degree program in engineering. Oh, wait, can I, can we back up for a minute? So you moved to yeah. France, you didn't know the language. You thought, I'll take a night class to learn a computer language that I also <laughs> don't know yet that's being taught in the language <laughs> I don't know yet. Is that, do I have that right? <laughs> Yeah, it's funny All when you right. say it back to me, it sounds you're, ridiculous. But you know what? I was like You're 20. inspiring, Nicole. Like, that is an amazing amount of... Uh, I, I don't want to underscore it because so much of where we wind up is, you know, co- like, good luck, right? Like, it's fortunate. Mm-hmm. It's the connections we make. And, um, you know, but that took some chutzpah, right? <laughs> I mean, that's one way to put it. Yeah, it's inspiring to me that that you were. I was like 20 something and I had no fear, right? Like it didn't, it didn't occur to me that it was crazy to move to a foreign country where I didn't speak the language and didn't have um, a visa yet to be there. It didn't, it didn't occur to me that that was a crazy thing to do. I guess, you know, my frontal lobe hadn't developed yet. It's admirable because, you know, that's also a way that good things get accomplished is that people take risks like that and um, you know, move way out of their comfort level. So it's great that you did that. And you did learn, like you signed up for a degree program and you, and you learn things and, the, and you learn French, I assume. Yeah. yeah. Eventually I started understanding things. Um, yeah. there was one whole lecture where I thought the teacher kept saying, for example, she was saying en revanche. And I thought she was saying, for example, you know, continuing on, uh, but maybe three weeks later, I would learn that en revanche means actually on the other hand. <laughs> and so she was actually giving contrary right. <laughs> information That's and so right. I had to like go back and like restructure all the things I thought I had understood because of, uh, um, you know, language problem. But I got yeah. really lucky. My TAs let me write my code in English. Um, so I didn't have to use French um, like function names and things like that. And, and that was a huge break. Interesting. So how did you wind up then at an agency and what were you doing at this French agency? Cause that we like, we've known each other for a while and somehow that's like the beginning of like, I, I lacked that, that whole thing about going to school there. Um, oh, really? how, do we, how do we get, yeah. How do we get to the agency? So I was taking that, that class I had done maybe I'm terrible with time, so I'm not sure, but like a year and a half of classes or something. And um, I'd learned like databases and um, uh, graphs and optimization, graph theory, graph theory, I think it's called in English, um, and, and a few classes of Java and algorithms and things like that. Um, and I had sort of just enough experience that this web agency was willing to take a risk on me. But again, I will say, like they knew people through my W3C folks, right? And so I got really lucky again that, you know, maybe they wouldn't have taken a risk on my like fairly faulty resume right. if I hadn't had that connection. Um, but because I did, they were willing to give me a chance. Um, France has like a three month trial period and they were they were willing to let me let me have a try. Nice. And then when I got in there, <laughs> it was actually... Um, it was really interesting. That's how I got into performance. They were working on a site um, that was for one of the biggest cell phone providers in Europe. And um, it was crashing every single time that you tried to do anything in Internet Explorer. So you'd move the mouse and it would crash. You'd <laughs> click wow. in a form control and it would crash. Um, it, and uh, no one could figure out what was going on. Um, but in part, because of my inexperience, I was able to figure out what, what had gone wrong. Excellent. And then from they there- They were putting JavaScript in their CSS for what it's worth. <laughs> I was gonna ask about that actually. Yeah, I was gonna ask about that. So <laughs> for anybody who might not know, um, like Internet Explorer used to support, it was behaviors, right? Like the HTC, that's what you're talking about? Yeah. So. Um, they have like made a number of like comeback attempts uh, almost because it is like very logical. The separation of concerns in CSS is quite nice and it feels like you would want to do that with 
JavaScript too. And behaviors was kind of an attempt to like, just put that right into your CSS. And, um, sometimes it was kind of neat, but a lot of times it was, uh, pretty fatal. <laughs> so the way that we were doing it as well um, meant that it was executing basically every time anything re-layouted re or painted, um, which yeah. I didn't know those words back then. So I couldn't have described it. But what I knew is when I put counters inside of these functions, they were executing like, you know, hundreds of thousands of times. Exactly. And yeah, crashing the yeah. browser. Um, but that's where my love of performance was born, was yeah. sort of for solving that problem. I was like, oh, this is a new this is a new, interesting kind of problem. So from there, you went to Yahoo. Is that right? I did. Yeah. Um, I moved back to California, or not back to, I moved to California um, for the first time and um, sort of the middle of the tech world and got a job at Yahoo working on their performance team. And Yahoo back then was like, I a mean, big deal. They were a huge deal. I mean, they were Google, basically. Right? Plus, there was um, YUI there, right? Um, yeah, that, I'm saying like they were they were basically like Google, like they all the things that you associate with Google today, like innovation and in front end frameworks and pattern libraries, like you know, material. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they had those things developing at Yahoo. Yeah. So what what did you work on there? Because I always thought that like that was when I like learned about you. So what did you work on there? Like you work on performance stuff? Yeah, I worked on performance stuff. Um, so some of it was figuring out what impacts UI performance, like, you know, or their selector patterns that make performance harder was working on like why slow, which was the Yahoo early sort of performance debugging tooling. Um, there was just so much we we didn't know back then. Um, another thing I worked on was de deploying the performance measurement system worldwide. Um, we needed to know how performance was going in order to get teams to improve it. And so I worked with all the different locales to get um, to get this uh, deployed. Cool. Yeah, kind of random. <laughs> then at some point, though, you went and started your own company. And I think that that's where I came to know about you was when you were at your own company. Yeah, it's when I had my own company that I did my first speaking engagement where I actually talked about my own work. Yeah. Um, so while I was at Yahoo, um, I was meant to be like helping teams and, and folks outside the company figure out performance, but it was very much like me sharing a team message about, um, about performance. When I left Yahoo, I went to a conference uh, called Web Directions North, which was put on by uh, by John and um, John Alsop. Yes, sorry, yes, John Alsop. And um, I was there was the night before I was supposed to speak, and I was hanging out with some other speakers, and I was like, you know, I really wish I got to talk about my own stuff. And they were like, well you got laid off from Yahoo, right? Like you're here because it was planned ahead, but you you were laid off. You don't have to talk about any of that anymore. Um, and I was like, oh yeah, I don't. They're like, go ahead, give your, give your stuff a try. Like go, go speak about it. And so I went and like over that night, um, wrote up my first uh, talk and slides about object-oriented CSS and what that meant to me to build um, CSS systems and, um, and we're, which are now called design systems, but sort of talking through like why I did the things I did and why they mattered and what was missing from CSS to make it work better. And that is where I first saw you. Um, yeah, it was that talk. Yeah, I would. I mean, we don't have to talk about this a lot, but I know that there are a lot of things that people are familiar with in CSS, you know, like now everybody's like a tailwind or you hate tailwind or you love tailwind or whatever and you know there was bem and smacks and you know <laughs> but really oo css was the first thing that thought about like in in a big coherent way all of those things that those other things came along and built off of Oh, yeah. And by a lot of years, like I published most like uh, utility classes or modifier classes, the stuff that Tailwind is 
uh, based on, I published most of that in like, I don't know, 2009 um, on GitHub and, um, and, you know, Smacks was, uh, you know, a variation on what I had, what I had suggested, basically adding naming conventions. BEM again adds naming conventions, which I was not particularly interested in that space. However important it is, that's not something I'd spend a lot of time thinking about. Yeah, I remember thinking it was a good talk and and reading a bunch of stuff on your blog, which yeah. you have running again, I think, right? It's, I got uh, it running again. Yeah, Sabernella.org, right? Sabernella.org. Yeah, it was broken for like a decade, and then I finally got it running again with the demise of with the demise of uh, the site formerly known as Twitter. I decided I needed to. Uh, have my own space on the web that wasn't controlled by a corporation. I think we could, we'll just, I'm going to keep calling it Twitter. You can call it whatever. Um, <laughs> I mean, me too. I just need yeah. that in addition. I know. I don't know how it is that I have never asked you this, but like, why Stubbornella? Like, what? Like, <laughs> oh God. Um, it's funny because I get to ask that in like, professional context all the time, which I never intended for it to be a name that I used sure. professionally at all. Um, I opened my Twitter account before I even did anything, you know, anything outward facing in that, in that particular way. It was actually a gift from a really good friend of mine um, uh, named Danbury. And okay. he got it for my birthday the demand <laughs> again, I didn't even really know about tech. I was still a carpenter. He gets me the domain name stubbornella.org for my birthday as a present. And um, the rest is history. I take it to mean persistent. That's that's great. I didn't know that you knew Dan that long. That's that's cool. Dan was another one of the W3C folks hanging out at that communal house. <laughs> I think it's a really like, it's it's a good name. Right. Like it, it's it's kind of catchy and you can remember it. And the fact that you do like wonder like, oh, it's like like why did they choose that name? Like makes you remember it. So I, I always thought it was a really good name anyway. Oh, thanks. So uh can we share, I think would be really interesting, like a little random factoid that um who is your first client at your uh your own agency that you created, your own company? Oh, yeah. So I started my company in December of 2008, which, if anyone recalls, was an enormous crash. Everyone was getting laid off. Uh, everyone was freaking out, not, not unlike uh, the last year. And um, I happened to start my company right in the midst of that. And I had just enough savings that I was like, okay, if I have to go and live in my sister's garage, this is the date that I have to do that on. And that right. was uh, somewhere midsummer. And about a month before that, I landed Facebook as my first client, um, working with them to improve their, um, their UI and their performance. Not too shabby. Right? I would say, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just want to say like, I realize how lucky and privileged I am, you Absolutely. know, and that something really bugs me about like rags to riches um, stories. Like I grew up in a, in a trailer with no indoor plumbing with an outhouse that we had to go out to even in the winter. Like, and so I know that makes it very tempting to give me this rags to riches story because almost nobody makes it from there to working at Google. Um, but I kind of reject that a bit because I think that I got really lucky I happened to know people who were already involved in early tech and were willing to be supportive of me. Um, I happen to be born smart, which I just don't think that people should have to have a list of like lucky and uh, you know different characteristics in order to have good outcomes. Like, yeah. and I want to say there were a lot of places where. It could have gone in a different direction for me. I could have like given up after I got laid off at Yahoo, or I could have, you know, moved back home right away with my sister, where there would have been a lot less opportunity for me. Um, and so there are cases where I was willing to take a risk, but I also don't think that people should have to be perfect in order to have um, absolutely a good life where they're paid enough. And and yeah, well said and important. 
I think. I think it's too easy for people to take your story and mine and think that people who come from working class families should just pull themselves up by their bootstraps when you and I did that to some extent, but in to a in a large degree, we also just had a ton of support in the exact yeah. right moments from people who helped us not have to do that. I mean, when I was a kid, I got I got free and reduced lunch at school. Like, would I be smart if I hadn't had free or reduced lunch? Probably not, because I would not have had enough to eat. And I think, yeah, I'm glad that society decided to invest in me enough to make it possible for me to um, be where I am. Super grateful and and aware of that privilege. Definitely. And I, I'm glad that they invested in both of us and that we're here because uh, I like talking to you. So oh, thanks. Uh, I think it's uh, regardless of like how you got here, there are amazing things that you have helped contribute to the web. And I think that the web is really lucky <laughs> that, uh, that that happened. So you wound up after you gave your OOCSS talk, um, you got pulled into South by Southwest. Is that right? So again, I, I spoke at John Alsop's conference, uh, Web Directions North, and there I met a bunch of amazing um, designers like uh, Cindy Lee, who has passed away since. And she was incredibly inspiring and like took care of me and um, basically told me like, you should go to South by Southwest. You're going to meet people there who will be important for your career. Um, and she sort of took me under her wing at South by Southwest and introduced me to a ton of people. Um, I was able to eat, meet, um, Jeremy Keith. And I think Eric Meyer may have been there too. Um, um, and then those folks actually introduced me to folks at an, a list apart and event apart, um, who then pulled me in to speak there. Um, and so there were just all these kind people along the way who, um, who made a huge difference. And I, I don't know if they knew they were, but they were just like saying to someone else, hey, have you met her? You should have her, you should have her speak or you should listen to her ideas. And um, yeah. And that slide deck, that presentation went from no views to 500,000 views in a couple of months. And uh, I, I was so shy and so introverted and so uncomfortable with that amount of attention. It, it took me a long time to come to terms with it. You also developed some tools at your agency, right? Um, like, yeah. Yeah. Tell us about what your tools, did you sell them or? Uh, you know, I at least had the idea that maybe we eventually would, but you know, also much more interested in the technology than in building a business. So it's, I guess, unsurprising that that didn't happen. It, it probably would have been more ripe for people to buy at that point because like open source was a lot newer, right? Like it wasn't, hadn't sort of taken over everything, but also there like weren't any dev tools in the browser for the most part. Right. Yeah. Firebug Fi building on top of firebug was possible for me to create tools just because that actually finally existed. Yeah. Um, and honestly, like I never could have open sourced my stuff if GitHub hadn't, hadn't, come to be, you know, so that in 2008 or nine, whenever I, you know, initially published my stuff, if there hadn't been a tool like GitHub, I wouldn't have been able to do it. It would have been out of my, out of my reach otherwise. So what do your tools help you do? Ah, uh, so one of them helped you um, find all of the topography that you'd created on the site. And so, um, you know, people would have like hundreds of shades of blue type on their site. And they would think they only had one or maybe two because they didn't realize they'd use slightly different colors for each example. And so, um, and similar for size of type and, and other things like that. So this tool would, uh, you'd turn it on and it would profile, you know, uh, however many pages you went to and then save up all those uh, combinations of size and color of font. And then give you like histograms to understand, like, I just found that arguments, performance arguments with designers were tough because if it was just, should it be design or should it be performance? They are always going to say, you, you know, UX, that they are giving up too much on the UX side in, in terms of getting this performance. 
But if instead you change the argument to, hey, you use this blue 1600 times and you use this one 23 times, can we make it consistent? Consistent is also performant and designers really care about consistency from a UX perspective. Um, yeah. And so uh, it kind of eliminated some of the arguments that um, have we built that into tools today? Because that's oh, yeah, really that's useful. So, like it's where, in so many tools now. Yeah. What what I don't know about this. Like where? Teach me. Where is this? Is it like in SAS um, or what was it called? I had a website for it, but I'm not sure I've even renewed the domain. Anyway, there are tools that do this. Maybe not the exact same way, but yeah, there's a there's actually a pane called CSS Overview in the Chrome Dev Tools um, that is not on by default. But if you turn it on, um, it will give you a sort of an overview of the different styles that you've used. Oh, my goodness. I had no idea. It doesn't do exactly what I'm talking about here, but it's useful. And then I also created Smush It, which was an image optimization tool. I remember Smush It. Yeah. And yeah. then I did that with Stoyan Stefanov. And then um, with Nicholas Zakis, I made um, CSS Lint which there was no linting tool at that time for CSS. So it was a first stab at, you know, helping people find bugs and, and figure out where they'd used styles incorrectly. So how did you wind up at Google from that point? Well, I had my own company for a while with Facebook as an initial client. I think you can imagine getting more clients was not as hard as it would have been had I gone a different route. So yeah. I was really lucky and got to work with, um, Box and uh, folks at Williams Sonoma and Salesforce and especially Trulia, the developers and designers there were amazing. Um, so I got to work with all these like big companies, figuring out how to get them unblocked and get them shipping UI. Um, and I, you know, the systems that I was creating, I always wondered like, are they are they working out? And I bumped into a developer at um, Box at a coffee shop once. And I was like, so um, how's it going? Really nervous, like I'm going to hear that it isn't working. And he was like, it's great. We've only written 100 lines of CSS since you left. Wow. Um, yeah. And I bumped into a developer from um, Facebook later who didn't work on the on the work with me. And I asked him, like, how is it creating UI on Facebook? And this is a back end developer. And he's like, oh, it's great. I don't have to think about it at all. And I was like, oh, good. This is working. Um, so yeah, I continued my company for a while. Um, and then I got invited by Chrome Engineering to go and spend a couple days with their team um, figuring out uh, what a new feature should look like. Um, and that, that feature would become web components. Um, and so there I was able to do things like say, hey, um, you're not going to have a component or two in a page. You're going to have hundreds or thousands because it's going to be all these smaller pieces that are nested and combined to make UX and, um, and letting them know how scoping needed to work, that you needed to have an end to your scope as well. Um, uh, at that moment, I was like, I want that job. <laughs> like, that's the job for me. And that was the beginning of getting to Google. So you applied to Google? I did. I applied to Google and I got rejected. Totally turned down. <laughs> yeah, I also have been rejected by more than one company. So yeah, big tech hiring is it's a whole thing. But I would say don't give up if you didn't get it the first time. I did get it the second time. Uh, but I will say like, the feedback I got was that I needed to be stronger at programming. And so as a result, I actually gave up my company knowing that I wouldn't get to do significant backend programming or even middle layer programming um, at my, you know, in my company. Uh, and so I gave that up in order to, um, in order to work at Pivotal Labs. They, I was often getting a bunch of their old clients that then needed their front end, their CSS and HTML cleaned up. And so at some point I was like, hey, you know, like you could teach me to code and I could come and I could do this the front end bits and, and teach your folks to, um, you know, to write really great CSS. And they were like, deal, <laughs> we'll, we'll do that. So I went and worked there for a while. And that's where I learned like Ruby and Rails and started understanding more about servers and backend and things like that. Um, getting myself ready for a second try at an interview at Google. Cool. Yeah. And you did. And um, I would say that since you've been there, 
a lot of good things happen. I think so. Uh, yeah, um, I'm really excited about everything we've been able to do. Do you know what what year did you start at Google? Was it 2018, 2019, something like that? Uh, 2018. Yeah. yeah. Because I also started at Agalia like nearish the same time, and oh um, really? <laughs> and my first, um, my first not Blink on, but just before Blink on was the Chrome Developer Summit, and mm. uh, you spoke at that event that I was at. Oh, uh, uh-huh. I think actually we sat together in the front row for another thing and took pictures of Jake Archibald's blue socks. <laughs> Um, I don't they're, remember. They're pretty that. neat. I, I should share them again. Um, but uh, you gave this talk with Greg Whitworth uh, that was it, sort of introducing OpenUI. Mm-hmm. And it was called HTML isn't done yet. And I, I've written about it and pointed to it a whole bunch of times. Uh, I think it's a, it's a great talk. And you're absolutely right. And I think uh, thanks for promoting that. Yeah, I think we had the idea that like HTML is complete or something and like we've got all the elements we need and then we'll just do everything else with classes and um, that just doesn't, that doesn't add up for me. I think that we, we sort of missed the mark with the extensible web manifesto. There was a lot of good in it about building solid foundations that could then be extended um, to sort of pave cow paths. Um, but I think we stayed in the part where we were building like low level APIs for too long and we didn't pave cow paths. So you know, every site ever practically has tabs um, or accordions or carousels or, you know, other of these like clear UI patterns, like a path, a cow path could not be more trodden down than, than those UI patterns. We didn't move from low level APIs into, um, into declarative APIs. So yeah, I I totally agree with you on that. And I've also uh, spent a, a number of, uh, a, a lot of effort writing blog posts. Uh, like I wrote one that was like the Tao of yeah. Yeah. Uh, the extensive web manifesto that tried to explain what it, what it meant. So it's been like, fun and interesting to work on things in open UI. Um, it's definitely a learning process, you know, how we integrate that and how we get it moving. But, um, I think, uh, accordion is going really well, really well. Um, yeah. And I think that's gonna, that's gonna probably chip everywhere like pretty quickly, I would imagine. Cause it's, it's uh, already in Safari's tech preview, I think. Yeah. See? There needs to be a few updates uh, based on the spec changes, but um, yeah, I think it's going to do really well. And since then, also, we've got, let's see, uh, just a few you know small things, container queries, uh, has, yeah. has. Um, Parent selector. Yeah. So which comes from has, yeah. CSS layers and... Anchor positioning is coming and I don't know, just a lot of really good things. So I, I attribute a, a lot of the success of that to, um, you know, the fact that you were in there as well. I mean, I'm not trying to lay that all at you. It took a lot of people. I'm just saying that I think having you in there was really helpful for getting all those things. So thanks for that. I'm grateful to have been able to be a part of it. I think that um, I think that developers shouted loud and clear about what they needed and what they were doing, and that w- that was also really helpful. You know, we were able to bring it back again and again to what are the use cases, what are developers trying to do, how are they doing it now. That was a big shift from how should they be doing it to how are they doing it now, and how do we enable them in the systems that they're already choosing. And so. I would turn that thanks back toward developers and the ways that they were able to guide the Chrome team and open UI and, and the overall um, web platform. Another thing that has been done since you've been there, which I think is really, really positive is the creation of the UI fund. Yeah. Um, can you like describe what the UI fund is? Sure. Yeah. Um, it actually started with the framework fund was the worst, the first one that I created. Um, that was with, um, 
with Malta Ubel and Shubi Panikur and, and Adi Asmani. And then um, after running the framework fund for a couple of years, we realized, hey, we also need um, a UI fund, something that would focus specifically on CSS and HTML. And the idea was, hey, we have all these engineers that are working on um, features and we're going from like conception to research to prototyping um, along with standardization and then to, you know, actually shipping it and, and that sort of thing. But then we're starting over again and, and starting research. <laughs> and what, what we realized was that research phase and that standardization phase is hard and long and it needs people who can really focus in on it and can really figure out, um, you know, the, the hard questions that we need answered in an area. Um, and in that way, we were able to sort of shift things back so that we're doing the research from one and then we're doing the, the prototyping of that one while we're starting the research from another. Um, and the UI fund was a big part of that because it allowed us to sort of um, work with a whole bunch of web developers to figure out if they had, you know, skills or desire to become um, spec um, writers or researchers. Um, and it's gone really, really well. It's sped up the engineering team an enormous amount. Um, we have folks like Anna Tudor who did a ton of research into um, input type range and just told us everything that's broken about it, which is fantastic. Um, we have folks like Miriam, Suzanne, she's written specs and done research and really guided the engineering teams um, uh, through the UI fund. Super great. I mean, uh, we should have had something like that in the web platform a long time ago. I, I think it's just super that you've helped set that up. Thanks. I mean, I like it seeing that like the CSS working group is actually really good at taking in newcomers. And there are a large number of people who've contributed more than 10 um, things to a spec. Whereas, you know, in a lot of groups, that's the, those numbers are far lower. Um, and so I think there's a real opportunity there to find developers who have that capacity for research and um, spec writing and get them making initial proposals. Okay, so uh, this was super fun. I, every time we talk, I just have a great time talking and reminiscing about these things. So thanks so much for uh, coming on with me and Paul. Hopefully people found it interesting. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I always like talking to you. Mm -hmm.